Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, live webinar on COVID-19, which is entitled Beyond Personal Protective Equipment. Let me start with a short introduction. As we all know, currently there is no vaccine to prevent infection with the SARS, uh, SARS virus, which as we all know is the cause of the coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID. So at this point, the only way to prevent uh, infection is to, be, uh, uh, to avoid being exposed to the virus. Therefore, basic infection prevention measures such as frequent hand washing, rigorous environmental cleaning and disinfections are of utmost importance in order to prevent virus transmission. This webinar will present some updates on, SAR, on the SARS virus. It will answer questions about the value of oral hygiene by gargling and the possible need for augmenting protocols recommended by the World Health Organization by using pro products with a proven effect against the SARS virus. In the second part of this webinar, we will, uh, we will tell you more into detail what are the current major challenging challenges facing antiseptics in 2020. And it is a pleasure to introduce the first speaker and I will ask her to present herself and tell, her, tell us a little bit uh, about her herself. And so the first presentation will be brought by Maren Eggers, and it is entitled Beyond Personal Protective Equipment, PPA, a new role for povidone iodine. Please, Dr. Eggers. Thank you so much for this kind introduction, Professor Monstre. Yeah, um, I'm working since 1997 in the Labor Endos, and I'm a clinical virologist but um, my focus is since more than 15 years on uh, developing of methods to prove the efficacy of disinfectants. As we have it now, we have a new emerging virus. We don't have any antivirals. We don't have any vaccine as uh, Professor Monstri um, told us. We need um, hygiene. Hygiene is so important in this case. And for hygiene, um, we need also um, disinfectants with proven efficacy. And in Europe, we are very lucky to have the uh, standardization, the European standardization. And I'm responsible for the viricidal test in this group. And today, I want to uh, introduce some new data on uh, SARS-CoV-2. But uh, I also want to... Um, show you some um, methods how these uh, tests are done in vitro. May I have the next slide? And yeah, um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, as uh, the virus is named, um, is belonging to the coronaviruses. We know that coronavirus can infect animals, uh, birds, but also human, and we no, for normal, um, so-called normal um, coronaviruses, for uh, they make mild uh, symptoms are mild colds. Uh, for example, the human coronavirus 229E. But we have also better coronaviruses that are um, causing severe pneumonia, um, and that was in 2002, the outbreak with SARS, first time. We had this kind of symptoms was 2002, 2003, more in Asia, but also in Canada. And then 2012, a new uh, better uh, coronavirus virus emerged that was MERS. It's causing the Middle East um, uh, respiratory syndrome. Um, and that's um, also very similar to SARS, both viruses are more um, related to nosocomial infections uh, in hospitals. And um, so it was easier to control and to contain these two viruses. 
SARS disappeared totally, MERS is still there, but not spreading around the world. With SARS-CoV-2, this is very similar to the other SARS-CoV virus, but it uh, behaves totally different. Next slide, please. Yeah, as you can see here, these is um, nasal epithelia cells. And in this nice um, publication, they showed that the main entrance of SARS-CoV-2 is the nasal um, epithelia cells. So these are the first target cells. And they need the enzyme receptor ACE2 um, to infect the cells. The green <coughs> is the receptor and red stain there on the right is uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. And um, SARS-CoV-2 virus is different to SARS because it spread more aerogen. It's more similar maybe like uh, measles virus or tuberculosis. Uh, so we have to control also the transmission uh, via aerogen um, aerosols, small drops and so on. And um, after the virus infects first uh, the nasal area, it can then cause also infection in the lung. And um, what we know now from USA, for example, is that also adults that had only one week symptoms and were then four weeks very healthy develop um, then more chronic diseases, heart failure, and knee, uh, then also the kidneys. And uh, this is called as long holer COVID-19 symptoms. So because at the moment, every two weeks, I must say, I learn a new uh, things about the virus. It's still a little bit foggy what's going on with this virus, especially in these uh, long-term sequelae. But um, that's because we know this virus just for a very short um, time. May I have the next slide, please? Yeah, as you can see here, it's a little bit of timetable, how uh, the, when the vir virus first occurred or was first named was in December the 30s, 2019. There were uh, infections in Wuhan and um, the China um, uh, authorities alerts the WHO. And then uh, from there, the virus spread also to other Asian countries, but also to Europe. And in 2011, the virus got its new name, SARS-CoV-2, and the disease was called COVID-19. And then um, March 11, the WHO declared a coronavirus a pandemic. Also, there were only 200,000 infected worldwide but now there are more than 33 millions infected and more than more than 1 million people died and um, if we would um, prolong this timetable we will see that now in Europe we have um, additional um, outbreaks again and we, I think we we are now um, at the beginning of a second wave everywhere in Europe in June, we contained it everywhere very nicely, but now in the winter time, uh, we, we are more in uh, closed rooms, uh, stick more together, the, the virus can spread um, again. And next slide, please. And um, I like these uh, Japanese uh, study because they focused on the clusters and they could show that 30% occurred in the healthcare facilities 16% in other care facilities like nursing homes, also a big problem in Germany. Then uh, the others occurred uh, where people get together in the bars, especially karaoke bars was a problem in um, Japan. And also in the work workplace, um, if a lot of people work together in one uh, office. So what they said is heavy breathing in close proximity is uh, really a problem. Also exercising in a gym was a case of an outbreak in South Korea. And um, what we also know is that a lot of people are spreading the virus also. They are pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic. 
And uh, we know that now that there are super, spre uh, super spreaders that can infect more than eight people uh, and the others are more uh, than infecting them one than to two people. So uh, with these super spreaders ev um, events, we have then a huge cluster uh, in the community. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, um, let me say something to the infectivity. If we um, culture the virus, then we can see that we can culture it from normal uh, healthy adults until day eight um, after onset of the symptom. That's also the reason why we have this quarantine that has to be 10 to 14 days. Uh, if we look on the PCR results, then it's more than 20 days uh, or even longer positive. Um, this is known also for influenza viruses that also we can cu can't culture any um, uh, infectious virus, the PCR is still positive. But if we look on immunocompromised people's uh, patients, then we see that they have a very prolonged virus shedding that is shown there on this table below. On the figure below, below it um, shows you that they have more than 60 days after uh, onset symptoms of uh, onset of the symptoms they can shed the virus. And I believe that's the same also for SARS-CoV-2, also we have not so much data now. Yeah, let, let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, we have already heard we need hygiene, hand hygiene and surface disinfection is very well established in the hospitals, wearing masks also and also in the community now and everywhere in the world. And I'm really astonished how fast that spread in over the world is wearing masks. Also, uh, even uh, our president from the United States is wearing masks now. We all practice now social distancing and cough etiquette, of course, but oral disinfection is something that is not so familiar in our European uh, um, community, in our European life. And first I was really reluctant to uh, if the masks are really helpful, but we, we don't have any real hard evidence that it's really working, but we see that with masks, social distancing, cough etiquette, we can control it somehow in the communities. And one other thing which is done in Japan, um, which is recommended in the universities and which is there always in the influenza season is uh, oral disinfection, gargling. Um, they train also the children in the kindergarten to do that. And uh, so we were focusing on this oral disinfection uh, during the MERS outbreak the first time and now again. And next slide. Um, we, um, also especially um, me, is, uh, I'm very interested in PVPI because that is one of the agents that we know since 60 years and it is really um, well tolerated. Uh, with um, the exception if you have allergy or uh, hypotheroidosis, then of course you shouldn't use PVPI. And PVPI uh, only disrupt the membrane and of the envelope virus and uh, it can't uh, develop any um, tolerance against PVPI. So this is a really um, very um, broad active target and um, it's a little bit lost in Europe to use it. And I think maybe this data can convince you that uh, PVPI is superior to chlorhexidine in case of viruses. In case of bacteria, chlorhexidine is very useful, but for viruses, um, it's not very active. Next slide. Let me first tell you something about um, the European efficacy tests. Um, in Europe, um, I uh, implemented three virus levels. The first level is now a claim called active against envelope viruses. The second level um, is then uh, envelope viruses plus adeno and noroviruses because these are the viruses causing a lot of outbreaks 
every year in the hospital settings. And the third includes also the enteroviruses like uh, enterovirus 71 or enterovirus uh, D68. So uh, this is then the highest uh, uh, viricidal level we have in Europe. Next slide. And um, we tested like this in Europe. We have mixed one part of virus suspension with one part of interfering substance. This interfering substance could either be clean conditions for um, visible clean surfaces, for example, or clean hands, because we have always a little bit protein load everywhere from the microbiome. The dirty conditions are conditions with uh, containing high protein load, but also erythrocytes, because we know that blood is the most difficult agent um, for disinfectant in, uh, in the surface, but also on hands. And so we decided to test uh, against both um, conditions. And then we have eight part disinfectant on top of this mixture. And after the contact time, is over. This mixture is then immediately stopped by uh, ice cold medium. Um, we can't give any neutralizing agent to this mixture because that would destroy the cells and we need our cells as to read the infectivity of the virus. Yeah, and this is then serially titrated and then um, uh, we May, uh, give then 01 milliliter on cells, wait then for one week, depends on the virus, and then we can uh, microscopically uh, check for any uh, CPE, that means cytopathic effect. Of course, some uh, agents can also have some toxic effect on cells, so we need always uh, cytotoxicity control and a virus control without disinfectant to see is the uh, system working and how much virus can we reduce with the disinfectant. Next slide. Yeah, and um, we need a four log reduction in Europe for viruses. That means if we have a contamination with 10,000 viruses, um, after one log reduction means 19% kill rate, only 1,000 viruses are left. With a log two reduction or 99% kill rate, 100 germs are left. A log three reduction, 99.9% .9 kill rate. This is more for the household disinfectant. They have always 99.9% .9 on the label. Then are still 10 viruses left. And uh, you have to uh, know that one to 10 viruses is enough to infect somebody. And that's why we choose in Europe the four lock reduction. That's 99.99% .99 kill rate. That means that then no virus is left. Next slide. Yeah, and I want to show you first um, the data with our um, test virus. That is the modified vaccinia virus Ankara. That's very safe for our stuff, but it grows also in high titers, as you can see here, up to 10 to the 7. And uh, so we have a and it's very resistant against disinfectants in contrast to influenza, herpes viruses, and so on. And that's why we choose in Europe this virus, because then if it's tested against this vaccine virus, you can be sure that uh, disinfectant is also active against other uh, envelope viruses. And uh, for example, with SARS-CoV-2, you need a specialized laboratory with a high BSL-3 standard and it takes some time to get the isolate and so on. And then you don't know what uh, kind of disinfectant I should know, should take. And um, therefore we have introduced the vaccinia virus as test virus in Europe. Uh, here is uh, something uh, not quite correct. It should, this uh, dashed line should be on four log reduction and uh, if you just imagine that it's four log, you, you can see that the gargle is very active. All the, the cleanser and the surgical scrub in the 10% PPPI um, solution was active against vaccine virus. Next slide. Um, we have also tested it against SARS 
uh, and MERS virus because um, in Asia, the people are not so familiar with our European tiered uh, testing um, approach. And I want to know, is it really active also against these coronaviruses? Next slide. And um, again, please focus on the fall lock reduction. You can see that it's really good active against uh, all these uh, skin clean, so surgical scrub, but also on, uh, against the mouthwash. And uh, that's a little small there on this table, but it was also active against MERS um, in a very low concentration. Next slide. So the, again, the same problem occurred then with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, the authorities in Asia wanted to know whether it is active. So we did this study in the BSL-3 lab uh, Singapore. Um, the head of this study was Danielle Anderson, Professor Anderson, and I was uh, advising her how to do this uh, EN 14476 testing. The European test method is now introduced and established in Singapore. Next slide. We have tested again for um, the same for um, PVPI solutions with 10% PVPI, 7.5% and 1% as goggle. And this is something uh, you can buy the everywhere in Asia. And I have this also at home. It's a throat spray with 0.45% PVPI. It's very con convenient to use it. So it's very popular in Asia. You can use it when you have a sore throat, but also I like it when you fly somewhere and you are in a meeting, you don't, you are not so sure, I use this throat spray. Next slide. Um, we tested um, 120 seconds of contact time and then also 30 seconds. And this study was done in four or three replicates, in independent replicates, um, just um, to be sure that it's not uh, just one event. So that's really uh, working. Next slide. Yeah, and uh, I can tell you that it is very fast active um, after 30 seconds. Um, there are now new studies from Malaysia where they show that it's also active after, after 15 seconds. And um, next slide. So I can conclude that these uh, PBI products are Again, very active against SARS-CoV-2 in just 30 or even 15 seconds. And um, this data was also reproduced by uh, other independent um, uh, group from the U University of Bochum. They um, compared seven or 11 oral rinses. It's just published this month in uh, Journal of Infectious Diseases and they found only three products active against uh, SARS-CoV-2. One was PVPI, one was ethanol, and one was uh, a special benzalkonium chloride um, solution formulation. Chlorhexidin was not effective. Next slide. Yeah, that's the paper I refer to. That's uh, from Professor Anderson. She's the first author and uh, from Singapore. And the other um, paper from Germany with the, uh, these oral rinses is uh, the author is called Meister et al. Next slide. Yeah, that's the other report. Um, it's, I can't see it uh, as well as you, but um, you see here the gray um, columns is the virus control and with PVPI uh, there is no virus left. In contrast with chlorhexidine you can find um, even um, after the contact time uh, more than 10 to the 5 uh, viruses still there. Next slide. So um, first of all very important if you choose a disinfectant and then you see the claim EN14476 active against 
envelope viruses. Then it is tested against uh, this modified vaccinia virus, Ankara, and this is the virus that is most resistant and um, even more resistant than SARS-CoV-2 or influenza. Uh, so you are then really on the safe side if you check for a disinfectant. You have to look if it's tested against uh, these virus and is claimed against it. And then on the other side, PVPI is uh, very old fashioned, but very, very active um, agent known for 60 years. And it's very fast virucidal active against um, not even the test virus MVA, but also against SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1, MERS-CoV. We tested it also against Ebola and influenza, and it was always uh, active um, after 15 seconds. Next slide. So now we come to the next point. Is it time for gargling renaissance? And there we have to uh, differentiate between uh, the community but um, and the use in the hospitals. Next slide. So gargles can reduce respiratory infection that is known from uh, several studies. Uh, even gargling with water um, um, has uh, lowered the incidence of URTIs for 11%. Um, gargle is also act effective against viruses. There is um, some data. Uh, you can read um, these data also in a new review published uh, this month, uh, it's, uh, it's in German, but it was also translated in English from Professor Kramer and me. He's a very well-known hygiene specialist in Germany. Next slide. And um, the PVPI-based disinfectants um, are widely available. So um, also uh, in a lot of countries, it is now included in their um, um, expert papers. Uh, for example, uh, Portugal is recommending um, the use of 0.2% PVPI. Belgium uh, recommends 1% PVPI. Malta recommends 0.2% PVPI. The Switzerland is recommending PVPI. Uh, they uh, recommend 1.25%. And also the WHO has included it now in a guideline for uh, oral disinfection for um, um, head neck uh, surgery, I think it was. Uh, there they included it in August, August as a 0.2% solution. But I agree to uh, Professor Monstre, maybe there can be a more clear guideline from the WHO um, saying what, uh, how these PVPI goggles uh, should be select, how ma many PVPI should be included and uh, maybe also give an instruction for the um, for the community because um, in the hospital you need a gargling uh, before you do aerosol um, producing um, methods like um, intubation or dentists use it and it is even more effective than uh, chlorhexidine, as I told you. And in this case, it can risk the infection rate of the um, stuff in the hospitals. Maybe next slide. Yeah, we have also um, compared PVPI versus chlorhexidine uh, in the hand hygiene. And uh, this is the test uh, for um, PVPI and chlorhexidine in, in the uh, E. coli system. It's called EN 1499. That is one of these methods developed by Professor Roger in the 70s. You know all of these six steps. That is coming from this method. And Professor Roger from Vienna, he developed this uh, test standard. And uh, you can see here that there is no difference between chlorhexidine or PVPI. But if we focus on the viruses, next slide. 
Oh, that paper was uh, hidden. Uh, that slide was hidden. Sorry. Uh, if we would focus on viruses, then we see that PVPI is active. Also, you need uh, 30 seconds for hand washing with it. And uh, E. coli uh, and um, the chlorhexidine product was not effective. Yeah, now I want to thank you for your attention. This is uh, one of our buildings of the Laboratory Enders. And there on the top on the balcony is the founder, Professor Enders. She was one of the first persons doing the uh, vaccination in Boston due, because she worked for Salk. She was a biologist, she a medicine, so she uh, did the vaccinations. She also uh, developed the measles vaccine, was very is very well known for rubella and varicella, um, uh, especially infections in the pregnancy. And um, she has, uh, she was almost 60 when she founded her laboratory. And we are, I think, very well known for very specialized virus questions, depending on diagnostics, but also on disinfection. Thank you so much. Okay. Dr. Eggers, thank you very, very much for an extremely interesting presentation. And at the start of this webinar, during my introduction, I forgot to mention that you can write down during the presentation your questions. They will be sorted out by the organizers and they will be addressed to us after the second presentation. So can we have the next slide? So welcome again for now the second presentation of this, uh, of this webinar. As you can see, my name is uh, Stan Monstre. I'm a plastic surgeon working at the burn center of the University Hospital in Ghent, Belgium. Next slide. So, the World Health Organization has identified antimicrobial resistance as one of the three most important problems facing human health. Next. And as we all know, it is the widespread and often inappropriate use of antibiotics, both for humans and in the vet by the veterinary, that has led to an increased prevalence of multi-drug resistance uh, in bacteria in the environment. Next slide. A recent review predicted that by 2050, the death rate could reach a staggering one person every three seconds if this problem of antibiotic resistance is not adequately addressed. Next slide. And it is actually this emergence of multi-drug resistance which has pushed us to re-evaluate the use of antiseptics for skin infection. So in this presentation, we're moving a little bit, not entirely, but a little bit away from the uh, COVID-19 issue. Next slide. As you can see, uh, maybe because we use it a lot in our burn center, but also because of the scientific aspect of it, I always have had a keen interest on the role of iodine in wound management. Our group already in 2003 wrote a review article, and next slide, much more recently, actually only a couple of months ago, this more extensive uh, review of the same group, at least of some people of the same group, was published in the International Journal of Antimicrobial Agents, and it was entitled Addressing the Challenges in Antisepsis, Focus on Povidone Iodine. It gathers almost 20 years of research, which will be discussed in this presentation. Actually, the aim of this second review was to investigate the key challenges in antisepsis, which are antimicrobial efficacy, also antiseptic resistance, very important antibiotic and antiseptic cross-resistance, 
and finally the effect uh, of uh, on wound healing and tolerability. The main focus, as I said, was on povidone iodine, always in comparison with the other commonly used antiseptics. Next slide. So in this presentation, I will discuss four major challenges for antiseptics, which you see here. And I suggest we move immediately to the next slide mentioning, next slide, mentioning the first challenge, which is of course very important, the efficacy with a special uh, focus on the inactivation by organic soil and blood. Next slide. If we take a look at the literature, it is pretty obvious that actually all articles talking about antiseptics mention that in an era of growing resistant bacteria, new viruses and microbes, a broad antimicrobial spectrum is needed. Actually, you, you could say this is by definition for antiseptics because a broad antimicrobial spectrum, you could say is the core business of antiseptics. So this you could read in all articles. Next slide. What was more surprising is that actually almost all articles comparing the antimicrobial spectrum of main antiseptics come to the conclusion that PVPI has the broadest antimicrobial spectrum. As you can see, it is active against vegetative bacteria, gram-positive, gram-negative, and important actinobacteria, also spores, uh, fungi, and viruses, as was already addressed by Dr. Eggers. Next slide. <clears throat> And it is also effective against the newer, more resistant bacteria. This is actually a, a study already from some time ago by McGlure, who showed that PVPI exhibited a highly significant superior killing effect on MRSA strains compared to chlorexidine, whether measured by rate of kill or final log reduction factor. Next slide. And also important, PVPI seemed to be, the efficacy of PVPI seemed to be less affected, uh, on, on MRSI seemed to be less affected by dilution compared to chlorexidine. And this is illustrated in the graphic to your right, where you can see that the log reduction factor is more quickly reduced with chlorexidine compared to PVPI. Next slide. One of the important new aspects which was brought up in the second uh, review was the more recent focus on microbiome. Indeed, increased fungal colonization has been shown to lead to a worsening wound environment suspected bacterial infection and an increased rate of prescribed antibiotics. Next slide. Many authors have indeed shown that nowadays, especially in chronic infections and biofilms, we can uh, observe a combined or a concomitant infection, both of fungi and bacteria. And for this reason, it is obvious that wound care strategies will benefit, of course, from the application of broad uh, topical antimicrobial agents that target both bacteria and fungi. And actually, I have to confess that we see more and more also these combined infections with fungi in our burn center. Next slide. In this, present, uh, in, in this article, it has been shown that chlorexidine aqueous washes are not effective in removing candidae auris from the skin of colonized patients. This in contrast to PVPI iodine and of course to uh, alcoholic uh, chlorexidine. Next slide. One last aspect of the efficacy and definitely a very important aspect 
is the inactivation by blood and organic soil, which are present actually in most of the wounds we have to deal with. Barreto showed that PVPI has the shortest time to efficacy or the shortest or, or the least required exposure time to achieve efficacy for different kinds of bacteria, both with organic soil and with blood, as you can see here uh, in, this, uh, in this graph. Next slide. This brings us to the second challenge, which maybe could be even the most important one in these re, uh, days of uh, multi-drug resistance, which is the resistance issue. Next slide. The European uh, community has mapped the percentages of invasive MRSA isolates all over Europe. And as you can see, and as most of us know, the per, the, they, these percentages increase the more you go south compared to the northern part of Europe. Next slide. I would say it's probably known since several decennia already. I was already thought this during my medical studies, which as you can see, were already some time ago. But everybody knows that there is a clear correlation between the development of resistance of bacteria and the topical antibiotic use. Actually, many people say that topical antibiotics maybe should no longer be used at all. So here, every, this is something everybody knows of. Next slide. What is less known and more recent, but definitely equally important, is the so-called cross-resistance uh, resistance issue. And I will try to explain this in a simple way. As you can see on the picture on the left, chlorexidine can, when coming in contact with the bacteria, can result, can activate the innate bacterial defense mechanism by an upregulation or an enhanced ex expression of the so-called multi-drug efflux pumps. Next slide. What do these pumps do? Once they are impressed, these efflux pathways can export uh, antiseptics, just like chlorexidine, but they can also, and this is something that is only known rather recently, they can also export certain antibiotics. This means that the efflux pumps, which have been stimulated after contact with chlorexidine, can result in a resistance against, uh, against chlorexidine, but also a resistance against antibiotics, even without having been in contact with the antibiotic. Next slide. This was shown in a clinical study uh, a couple of years ago, uh, about uh, Klebsiella pneumonia isolates. As, we all, as many of us know, the Klebsiella pneumonia are susceptible only to a very limited of end-line antibiotics. Most of them are carbonepam resistant. And one of the few antibiotics, many of them are still uh, sensible to is cholecystin. Therefore, we need to secure the efficacy of these end-line antibiotics. Well, in this article, it was shown that uh, there had been an adaptation of clinical uh, Klebsiella pneumonia isolates after exposure with chlorexidine, which was leading not only to a resistance against chlorexidine, but also a cross resistance against cholecystine, as I mentioned, without ever having been in contact with that antibiotic. Next slide. It has also been shown that exposing Pseudomonas aerogonosa in increasing concentrations uh, with octanidine can lead to an increased tolerance, not only against octanidine, but also to chlorexidine. Next slide. This was an, uh, 
study by Mendoza in patients in whom the daily bathing of patients with soap and wash and water was replaced with a no rinse clean, uh, skin cleansing with 2% chlorhexidine impregnated wipes. And as you can see, he was able to show that body washing with these chlorhexidine wipes facilitated the establishment of a more virulent acinetobacter, which was an acinetobacter with a much higher biofilm production, as you can see in the graphic there below. Next slide. The surprising thing was also, and I think it's worthwhile, mention, worthwhile mentioning here, was that daily bathing with those aqueous uh, chlorhexidine wipes didn't reduce the incidence of healthcare associated infections, as you can see here in this study. Next slide. So Kampf concluded that general preference should be given to biocidal agents without or with a very limited selection pressure, which means antibiotics and antiseptics with no cross resistance to uh, antibiotic, uh, antiseptics with no cross resistance to antibiotics. And as you can see in this group, we have polyhexanide and even more so povidone iodine. Next slide. So, and maybe this is one of the most important uh, slides of my presentation because it shows, and after what I just said, that PVPI could become more and more important to secure the future of antibiotic treatment. And as we all know, despite the widespread clinical use of PVPI over so many decades, in none of the articles, in none of the journals, there has been any report so far of resistance or increased tolerance to PVPI in any laboratory derived or clinical isolate. Next slide. This brings us to the third challenge, also a popular one nowadays, which is uh, the biofilm issue. Next slide. Most bacteria, I would say almost all bacteria, don't grow in a planktonic or floating form, but do grow rather in sessile communities, eventually developing in a biofilm. A biofilm is a heterogeneous structure of different populations of microorganisms surrounded by a mostly polysaccharide matrix that allows their attachment to inert or organic surfaces. Next slide. What is important to know about biofilms that more than three quarters of chronic wounds show uh, are affected by biofilm. And some say that even up to 40% of acute, acute wounds are affected by biofilms. Probably the most essential thing about biofilms is that they provide to bacteria a protection against host defenses and topical uh, antimicrobials <clears throat> by reducing the diffusion uh, of those toxic compounds. It has also been shown that it delays wound healing by eliciting inappropriate inflammatory response <clears throat> which is ineffective, poorly orchestrated, and which can even damage the host tissues. <clears throat> Next slide. Also important to know is that Staphylococcus and Pseudomonas are the most prevalent bacteria present in these microbiota of chronic wounds and microfilms. Next slide. What do we know or what do we need to know about biofilm treatment? Well, I guess most of us are familiar that visible slough and debris should be always removed. But we have to realize that this never contains the total biofilm. For this reason, 
repeated debridements are necessary to suppress the biofilm development and keep it in a weakened state facilitating anti-infection measures. Some say that, micro, that biofilms can even regrow already after 24 hours. Even more important is <clears throat> that this repeated debridement should be used in conjunction with antiseptics to further reduce the uh, microbial burden and uh, reduce the microbial cells, uh, uh, cells and suppress the regrowth of biofilm. Next slide. I already mentioned that Staphylococcus and Pseudomonas are the most prevalent uh, bacteria in biofilms. And for this reason, this study of Johanni uh, of 2018 is so important. He was able to show that after 15 minute exposure, that with 15 minute exposure, PVPI was the only antiseptic to show complete and efficient killing of both Staphylococcus and Pseudomonas biofilms. Next slide. And I just mentioned the importance about the concomitant infection of fungi and bacteria. And uh, in that, on that behalf, this study of Keen is important because he showed he investigated the biofilm sensitivities of uh, Candida auris to various antiseptics. And he showed that the most effective treatment strategy was 10% PVPI, which eradicated all types of Candida uh, isolates and biofilm phase, and very important, both for early and for mature biofilms and you see it here uh, in this graph. Next slide. Uh, Hill also specifically investigated the effect, uh, he, he compared the effect of PVPI versus silver, silver, which is also often mentioned in the treatment of biofilms. And he showed that iodine-based dressings completely disrupted established seven-day biofilms with Staphylococcus and Pseudomonas. In contrast, only two of six silver containing dressings exhibited an effect and only on three day biofilms, but never compared to P PVPI, never on seven day biofilms. Next slide. And this brings us to the fourth and the last challenge for uh, antiseptics, which deals with skin tolerability and wound healing. Next slide. What does the recent literature say about the cytotoxicity of antiseptics? Well, first of all, it confirms that in vitro cytotoxicity can be much more pronounced than the situation in biological systems with a three-dimensional matrix and a vascular system. And it, that uh, the in vitro cytotoxicity does not necessarily reflect the situation in vivo or in the clinical situation. It also showed that recent cytotoxicity tests have shown that PVPI has a very low cytotoxicity compared to other antiseptics when tested on skin. And this was uh, versus polyhexidine, octinidine, chlorhexidine, and even hydrogen peroxide. It also showed, and I think this is a very important thing, that povidone iodine is the only, is the only antiseptic that showed remaining cell viability at the minimal bactericidal concentration of 1.32 grams per liter. Next slide. Some say a safe antiseptic is one that you can put into the eyes. And um, in, on this behalf, I can mention the fact that many ophthalmologists use PVPI uh, preoperative disinfection as a routine before their cataract surgery. And even more so, 
PVPI drops are often used uh, to treat adenoviral conjunctivitis. So they're also put into the eye, both in adults and in children. So if it's really true that something that you can put into the eye is safe, PVPI should definitely be considered as safe. Next slide. <clears throat> but uh, the more limited cytotoxicity has been uh, demonstrated also in many scientific studies. Here, the study of Miller, who demonstrated that PVPI is less cytotoxic, cytotoxic for, fibro, for fibroblasts compared to other antiseptics. His cytotoxicity tests showed that PVPI is better tolerated by murine fibroblast, more than 20 times versus chlorexidine, more than 30 times versus polyhexanide, and even up to 50 times versus octinidine. Next slide. <clears throat> For this reason, Muller concluded that only in the case of PVPI, cells start to grow after antiseptic treatment. He even uses the word revitalization of the cells. And, <clears throat> sorry, this may be one of the reasons why wound healing uh, is better tolerated with PVPI. Next slide. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, and this was confirmed also in this study, which was already performed some time ago. It was a, a study of Pierre He compared the healing of leg ulcers with PVPI and hydrocolloid versus hydrocolloids alone. And as you can see on the chart to the right, the weekly reduction uh, with PVPI added to the hydrocolloid was superior to the healing with hydrocolloids alone. Next slide. And I'll be short here, because, but this slide summarizes a lot of recent literature, which we mentioned in our uh, second review. And the only thing I wanna say is that um, despite previous misconceptions about the irritant and especially the allergic properties of PVPI, it is nowadays universally agreed that PVPI has the safest antiseptic profile in terms of irritancy and allergic and allergy, as you can see here. <clears throat> Next slide. So this brings us to the conclusion of the extensive review we performed in our last article. What can we say? Compared to chlorexidine, uh, polyhexanide, and octinidine, povidone iodine seem to have several advantages, of which I mentioned the most important one, the broadest spectrum of activity. It is highly effective at eliminating the multi-drug resistant pathogens and biofilm. It maintains its efficacy in the presence of blood and organic soil. There is a complete lack of resistance, and as I mentioned, of cross resistance when using PVPI, and this uh, despite the fact that it is used for so many decades. It is, in contrast to previous misconception, it is highly tolerated with a very low prevalence of aller allergic reactions, less than 0.4%. And there have been several reports of the promotion of wound healing in various ulcers. Next slide. <clears throat> the ultimate conclusion of our review was that with increased understanding of the importance of tackling antimicrobial resistance and bacterial biofilms in acute and chronic wound care, alongside improved understanding of the challenges of antiseptic use, PVPIs remains a very promising agent for the management of antisepsis nowadays. Next slide. 
we're almost at the end of our presentation, but there was one thing I still wanted to address because I still notice that uh, many people are not always aware of one very important aspect of PVPI, which deals with the so-called equilibrium. Whenever you use PVPI, there is an equilibrium of povidone bound iodine compared to free iodine. Free iodine, as we all know, is the truly active agent. And the more iodine is consumed for germicidal activity, the more free iodine is released from the povidone iodine reservoir. So you, we are always sure, even as I showed with increased dilution, there is always an equilibrium with a sufficient amount of active free iodine. Next slide. And this brings us to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. I would like to thank everybody uh, who participated. I would like to thank the organizers and especially Dr. Uh, Eggers. I hope thank you, we will be Martin. able to meet life in the not so, yeah. far, away, uh, in the not so far away future. Thank yeah. you very much. And thank you. Goodbye. Thank you so much.